Good evening. Welcome to the final Q&A of 2013. I'm Tony Jones and answering your questions tonight, best-selling author and commentator Tara Moss, shadow treasurer Chris Bowen, barrister and human rights advocate Julian Burnside, senior Indonesian journalist Yulia Sapadmo, parliamentary secretary to the Prime Minister Josh Frydenberg and former US assistant secretary of state, now distinguished international fellow at the Lowy Institute, Kurt Campbell. Please welcome our panel. Thank you. And as usual, we're being simulcast on ABC News 24 and News Radio, so you can also join the Twitter conversation with the Quanda hashtag that just appeared on your screen. Well, our first question tonight is from Kefius Yap. Do you think the current response from the Indonesian government in relation to the spying scandal is a chess beating exercise in preparation for the upcoming Indonesian presidential election? Or is it a start of a long term decline in Australian Indonesian? relations. Yulia, what do you think? Oh, okay, putting me on the spot right at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've flown you into Jakarta. That's in right. In from Jakarta, I should say, <laughs> for this right. purpose. That's right. Appreciate that. Well, that's a, that's a tricky question because the answer is yes and no. Uh, as you know, we are preparing for next year's presidential election and some uh, presidential hopefuls are, I think, using this issue uh, to their advantage also so that they will get, you know, traction on media. But at the same time, you have to remember that whatever is happening between Indonesia and Australia is of concern to a lot of Indonesians, whether they are politically interested in what's actually happening or whether it's just out of curiosity. Um, Kompas Daily just released uh, polling today. Uh, which basically said that a lot of Indonesians follow this story every day. And it's quite rare, rare that a lot of Indonesians would follow such foreign policy issues like this. But, you know, it, it does strike a chord in a lot of uh, average Indonesians in the sense that in, uh, uh, Indonesia considers Australia as its closest neighbor. And in the last 10 uh, years, relations have been well, and a lot of Indonesian students obviously study here. So when something like this happens, I guess people know that spying between countries happen, but when it actually surfaces like this, they're quite shocked that, oh, it's Australia doing this? So, you know, it might sound naive to some people, but a lot of Indonesians still think that it's quite surprising when it's actually, you know, put out there. So there is some national sentiment coming up to the surface as and well. And the second part of the question, does it have a, the prospect of damaging in the long term Australian-Indonesian relations? Well, I, I can't say, uh, you know, because I'm not a toothsayer or a seasoned diplomat like Kurt, but I would say that in my capacity as a journalist, I see that the Indonesian-Australian relationship is way too important uh, because we've had crisis in the past and I don't think this is the worst that Indonesia and Australia has seen. So I think we will eventually get over this, hopefully. But, Kurt you know. Campbell, what do you think? I have to say, I think the relationship between Indonesia and Australia has matured remarkably in a decade. And I think both sides understand very much uh, the stakes and they can't afford to risk what is an incredibly valuable relationship to both sides. And so I think the questioner asked the right, uh, posed the right question with respect to uh, positioning for the upcoming election. But let's also remember SBY also has his legacy to deal with. And he does not want to go out with one of the most important relationships that Indonesia has in tatters. So I, I think that uh, both sides are carefully maneuvering behind the scenes. And I'm pretty hopeful. I think we're going to be able to recover from this. And my expectation is that in a year's time, the relationship between the two countries will actually be better and probably stronger because of this. And there will be even more cooperation on intelligence and private interactions than there is today. Um, what about the prospect of one of those nationalist um, candidates becoming president? Uh, because that, that could actually change the nature of the relationship in itself when you consider that some of them, some from the nationalist parties, are sending out these demonstrators in front of the Australian embassy right now, protesting uh, very loudly about this whole thing. Look, it's, it's best not to get into too much discussion about a complex election that's going to play out over the course of months. But I will tell you, despite what has transpired over the course of the last couple of weeks, if one of these nationalist candidates 
comes to power, you're going to have challenges no matter what, no matter if nothing happened over the course of the last 10 days. Josh Frydenberg, the question was about whether this is chess beating in Indonesia or something more profound and whether it has real serious issues down the track for the Australian-Indonesian relationship. Well, look, this is an extremely difficult issue for Tony Abbott and his government to navigate. Uh, he's only been in office for 10 weeks and this is dealing with allegations that are four years old. Uh, and I can understand the concern in Indonesia. But I share uh, my fellow panellists' a belief that the relationship is too important to let flounder. So while there's some heat now, I think that cool heads will prevail. Um, just think about it. In 1999, over the East Timor issue, there was, you know, a really difficult patch. Um, and then since then, we were great friends to Indonesia after the tsunami in 2004, after the Asian financial crisis in 1997-98. And likewise, Indonesia's been a terrific friend of Australia, helping us capture the terrorists after the 2002 Bali bombing. And as you pointed out, there is great people-to-people -people links. There are 14,000, Tony, Indonesian students studying in Australia, and some one million Australians visit Indonesia every year. And that is a really important relationship. So whether you take the education, the people-to-people -people links, the trade deals, working together on border protection and counter-terrorism. There's just too much at stake to allow this relationship to deteriorate. Chris Barn, let's go to you. I mean, uh, you're going to take the Team Australia approach? Well, to answer the question, I don't think it's the former, and I certainly hope it's not the latter. We can't let it be. We can't let that happen, let it be the beginning of a long-term deterioration in the relationship, because it's too important. We've got the fourth most populous country uh, in the world. They'll probably overtake Japan to be the third biggest economy in Asia sometime over the next uh, 30 years. And they are a good friend, as Josh said. Uh, they want to work with us on many things. And we should actually, I think, ideally, treat this as not just a challenge, but hopefully an opportunity to try and deepen the relationship, make it less transactional, less about what we can do for them and they can do for us on any particular day, and have a deeper understanding of the importance of the relationship and, and the importance of each other's cultures and really have a use this as an opportunity to rethink deepening the relationship going forward. That would certainly, I think, be in Australia's best interest and I, and I think would also be in Indonesia's. And I think in SBY, in um, Vice President Bedino, in Foreign Minister Nalagawa, you've got three people, uh, very senior people, whose inclination, strong inclination, is to be friendly towards Australia, to be pro-Australian. And I think uh, when you're seeing these people react in this way, it's, a, it's an indication that they do regard this as being very serious. Let's quickly go back to the question. He's got his hand up. Um, if Mr Josh Frydenberg thinks the relationship with Indonesia is that important, why doesn't the Prime Minister actually apologise, saying it didn't happen on his watch and he will guarantee it will not happen again? Will that not come as a good um, not, um, reason to placate SBY? Look, that's a very fair question. Um, the answer is because Tony Abbott's sticking to a long-standing tradition in Australian foreign policy adopted by both sides of the political divide, not to comment on intelligence matters. Uh, because you think about it practically, if you were to comment one day on one issue because it's accurate, and then the next day there's another allegation which is inaccurate, do you, do you then not comment? In terms of giving commitments to certain leaders and the like, if you give a commitment to one leader, do you give it to leaders of other countries who seek a similar commitment? Do you give it to all cabinet ministers? It, you, you're opening a Pandora's box when you go down that line. So Tony Abbott really is sticking to a long-standing standing tradition in Australia not to comment on specific intelligence matters. Yep, Kurt Campbell. Let me just make two points on that if I can. First of all, this is quite unfortunate and frankly it's uh, the responsibility of lack of protection on certain secrets in the United States, but we're at the very beginning of a whole string of revelations that are going to follow, and so you just don't know what to expect. So you have to be very careful how you handle this going forward. Are you saying you, you don't know what to admit to at this point because it no. could actually get worse? <laughs> I'll let that stand. Um, <laughs> I, 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 will say, I will say it, 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 the second uh, matter, though, I, I've heard a lot in Australia about, gee, let's follow the example of the United States and Germany. I have to say this. 
the relationship between the United States and Germany is different than the relationship between Australia and Indonesia. And I think it's very clear that Australia wants a good relationship with Indonesia, but it is undeniably the case that some of the greatest challenges to Australia's security have emanated in Indonesia. Now, you have to, be, you have to handle that carefully. You have to deal with it uh, uh, carefully. But at the same time, that is a reality that the national security apparatus in Australia has to reflect on. Uh, Kurt Campbell, I'm just going to follow up quickly mm -hmm. on that. Um, if you're saying that it's different, that the same commitment that Obama gave to Merkel, which is we won't do it again, can't be made in this case. Is that because you consider that we don't have the same relationship with Indonesia that America has with Germany, i.e. we're not as close to them? No, in fact, I, I think the case is, if you listen carefully what some of the Indonesian leaders are saying, they're saying, let's establish a protocol for how we interact with each other on a variety of issues, national security and intelligence. That is exactly the right approach. And we have, the United States, with a number of complex friends, Pakistan, Russia, China, certain agreements about how we interact and work with each other with the recognition that the relationship is complicated, is complex. The relationship between the United States and Germany is just of a different order than the relationship between Australia and Indonesia. But the, the table has been set for the beginning of a conversation that I think can satisfy both sides. So, but just briefly, you're saying that it would be wrong for Australia to make a commitment to the Indonesian president that we won't do this again. I think, uh, in truth, the best way to handle issues associated with intelligence, if at all possible, is to deal with them privately, not out in public. And I think the beginning of an exchange of private letters between the two leaders is the right way to start this process. OK, we're just gonna, uh, before I bring in the other panellists, yes, I, I do want to hear from you a bit. We've got another question which relates to this, and we'll just go to that one, and then I'll bring in the other panellists. This is from uh, Maeve Curry. Yes. Uh, Jeffrey Robertson QC has pointed out that Australia's mobile phone hacking of 10 top Indonesians was not only unacceptable, unethical and downright stupid, um, but also in breach of Australian law. Uh, the Intelligence Services Act provides only three legal grounds for such an invasion of privacy by security services. It has to be in the interest of Australia's national security or foreign relations or economic well-being. Now, the Indonesian president's wife's personal mobile phone was hacked. A disgraceful invasion of her human right to privacy, but even more alarming, it's illegal. And when you consider that Scott Morrison is calling asylum seekers illegal, when there's no Australian law he can point to that they're supposed to be in breach of, um, my question to the panel is, how can we, as mere members of the public, be expected to respect and abide by the law when our own government shamelessly uses it to violate our own human rights. Julian Burnside, we haven't heard from you yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's a terrific question, and I don't think I could improve on it by answering it. Um, <laughs> Give it a go, uh, though. I, I, agree, I agree with you. I, I, th I think it's addressing it up a bit uh, to call it spying. It is phone hacking, and that puts a different cast on it. Um, I, I also, you know, I agreed with um, most of Kurt's sentiments. I, I would say that the relationship between Australia and Indonesia is a bit like your relationship with your mother-in-law. You just have to make it work. And <laughs> we're not doing a very good job at that at the moment, but there's a really interesting question. Why have we not handled this fairly obvious problem a bit more intelligently? And one cynical explanation might be this. It looks as though, at least in the short term, uh, Indonesia is not going to be cooperating in Australia's desire to stop uh, boat people getting to our shores. Um, uh, a, a bit of a, a set to with Indonesia is a perfect excuse for the fact that the idea of stopping the boats hasn't worked and won't work. Um, so I'm just wondering whether that's a politically a possible explanation for the silence. But I don't know if Josh can show any, shed any oh, light. No, on I'll, I'll come back to uh, Josh Strudenberg in a minute. But let's hear from Tara Moss on this. And the general question, really, I mean, uh, Julian Burnside is right in saying, in a sense, this is phone hacking. And as we've learnt from the Snowden revelations uh, about the PRISM operations around the world, it's very, very widespread indeed. And it has been for some time. I mean, I've, I've written in one of my novels about a code name, Echelon, where we have the SIGINT uh, systems, many countries cooperating on 
basically tapping all of our phones, every, every bit of electronic um, communication that we have. This has been around for a while, and that was the one thing in a fictional book that no one believed, <laughs> right? So I think it, this is a revelation for people in general that there's a lot of spying taking place. I'm not sure that phone tapping isn't spying. Um, I think it's a form of spying, so I'm not, I'm not sure about that distinction myself. But I think in terms of Indonesia, um, we really need to accept that Indonesia was put in a position where it couldn't really do anything other than what it did. You know, this is a very public revelation. Imagine what would have happened if it had become public that Tony Abbott's wife's phone, her personal phone, had been hacked by Indonesia. Australians would have been outraged. Mr. Abbott would have been outraged, and he would have shown that outrage. And that's what we're seeing from Indonesia. It's not so strange and foreign that this is taking place. This is all very normal. What we have to ask ourselves is, how did we get in this position where there was no better diplomatic response? You know, Why could we not have handled this uh, more smoothly, I suppose? And perhaps Julian has a point there. Perhaps there is some sort of strategy behind it. But if there is, it's very difficult to kind of understand why, when that friendship is so important. I'll get it, Josh Rydberg. You might want to uh, take up this uh, allegation, in a way, that uh, mm. this is cover for the boat's policy not working. I think it's very wrong to conflate the issues. In fact, it's uh, a line that Tanya Plibersek has been pushing, and I think it undermines Australia's common position. In fact, if you go back to SBY's press conference with Tony Abbott, just after Tony Abbott became the Prime Minister, uh, SBY said that Indonesia and Australia were both victims of people smuggling. To have 10,000 people sitting there in Java waiting to come to Australia and having, you know, just transiting through uh, Indonesia is not in Indonesia's interests. They've got as much uh, at stake as we do in trying to stop the boats. And in terms of our policy, we need to work cooperatively with Indonesia, and this is making it more difficult. But there has been very good cooperation, and Operation Sovereign Borders, Julian may not like to hear this, but it is actually working. All right, we're gonna, we'll come to that we issue. We don't know, do we? Because we're not allowed to know. <laughs> it's an on water now. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll... OK, we'll come back to on-water matters uh, in a little sure. while. But uh, can we stick to the question that was just asked there? And uh, to your knowledge, would it be illegal to tap the phone of the wife of a president of a neighbouring country. Well, that would require me to confirm allegations. No, and, and, no, and I, I'm no not that's, go to that's that. actually uh, just a question on principle, as whether it would be legal or illegal to do it. Well, not whether it happened, but whether it be legal to do it. Well, we do not comment on intelligence matters and what Australia may or may not be doing. <laughs> but, Tony, in terms of the legality of whatever Australia does, I am very confident um, that our processes are adhered to. Um, look, this is an extremely difficult issue. Uh, you know, uh, as Tony Abbott said to the Parliament, all countries gather information. You've had senior members of the Indonesian intelligence community talk about their own experiences. Um, and the Australian public expect the Australian government, whether it's a Labor or a Liberal government, to do everything that they can to protect Australian citizens. And we saw in Bali the painful price that we paid for a failure of intelligence. Now, the Australian community expect... They expect the Australian government to do everything that they can to protect the national interest. And intelligence is a very important part of that. So, I actually want to hear from Yulia in a minute, and then I'll go to Kurt. But I just want to bring... You're a new government, so sure. I imagine this came as a bit of a surprise to you. Uh, that this sort of thing was happening, whether you admit it or not. So my question to you is, did you then work out whether or not it was legal or illegal to actually do it, as the questioner says it was well, illegal? In I mean, the Prime Minister um, he has taken advice from the relevant agencies and he has written to the Indonesian President and we're waiting the, the response back. Um, but as the Prime Minister said very you know, carefully in the Parliament, uh, Australia, um, like all other countries, gathers information with the purpose of protecting its citizens, and it makes no apology for that, uh, and it doesn't comment on specific intelligence Sure, services. but with respect, have you asked the intelligence <laughs> services whether they're operating within the law? Well, because I, if they're not, well, I can wouldn't there be very, an inquiry? I can state very emphatically for you, I am very confident that the Australian intelligence services are operating within the law. Yulia, now, you're listening to these explanations. How do you think they will go down in Indonesia? Well, it's already gone down, uh, basically, because... <laughs> <laughs> Josh. <laughs> so, OK, the thing, the question uh, that was raised, yes, every country, in terms of intelligence, gathers, sure. you know, in whatever means 
is necessary. Uh, that's a given. The, I think the surprising thing and the, the thing that hurt most was that if, if the, the spying or the phone tapping is done in terms of Australia's national interest to protect Australia's national interest, the fact that it was the president, his wife, and his inner circle that was tapped during those 15 days in 2009. Now, a lot of Indonesians are asking, what is so threatening that you know, the phones of these political elite are tapped during those 15 days? That's all we really want to know. If it was in the interest of uh, Australia's security or whatever, we have the Lombok Treaty. Sure. It's, it's given yeah. that intelligence uh, uh, agencies in Indonesia and Australia yeah. are, are at liberty to share uh, information yeah. regarding uh, terrorism, uh, uh, people smuggling, and so forth. It's, it's written right there in the treaty. So what's the point of having a treaty if you're going to tap anyway to gather information that what it's to secure Australia's national interest? That's just, I'm sorry, that's just wrong. Let's bring Kurt Campbell in here. He wanted to get in before. And uh, yeah. I know you've actually made the point in interviews uh, since you've been in Australia recently. Uh, you, the point that you've made is that these are the most sensitive intelligence operations, gathering information on your neighbours and friends. Look, it's uncomfortable, but I will tell you, I spent uh, several years of my life representing the United States, the United States government. Some of the most sensitive uh, missions I went on were to neighboring states, our closest allies, and we were warned about how to uh, behave and how to be careful about every aspect of our interaction. I think one just has to accept that a certain amount of that is in play. I will also say, ultimately, when more information is known, ironically, it actually can be somewhat stabilizing. And I would say probably the most important in, uh, information that Indonesia receives on these various matters actually comes from Australia. Uh, the, the, the real issue, though, is a larger point. And you know, Australia has a slightly different history here. But I, I would say what we are seeing is the end, at least in the United States, of what I would call the 9-11 period, in which we um, tried to do everything possible to um, gather information, do things to protect our security and our safety. But I think larger questions are being raised about the balance between personal uh, safety and privacy and larger issues of security. So I think in a way what we are witnessing with Snowden, with some of these revelations, are uh, a public questioning that will end up in the pendulum swinging back more towards um, protecting uh, personal security, um, privacy uh, in many manifestations. I've got to ask the obvious question. When you went on these highly sensitive missions uh, into your friends and neighbours, uh, or in countries of friends and neighbours, uh, were you carrying transcripts of their conversations had on the phones earlier? <laughs> I, I don't want to have to fall back and we don't comment on that, but we, but we don't comment on that. <laughs> uh, Julian, can you just uh, talk to this general point that's just made there about whether the balance of privacy and, and the abuse of privacy by intelligence services is going to have to be redressed? Uh, look, the touchstone for legitimate spying has got to be whether you can expect reasonably to get usable intelligence. Uh, the idea that uh, hacking SBY's wife's phone is going to generate usable intelligence strikes me as being utterly implausible and it's offensive. I mean, it, someone said, what if it was Tony Abbott's wife? What if it was President Obama's wife? People would be horrified because they could not immediately see any possible uh, security advantage in that. It's just offensive. Um, I think privacy is obviously very important. Some people's privacy is going to be compromised if they have some strategic security value. Uh, I don't know how all of that works. I'm not in the Spooks Brigade. Um, I'm, I'm still astounded by the fact, though, that, um, you know, given that this happened in 2009, why didn't Josh's mob just blame it on Chris's mob? Because they were in okay. jail. Uh, well, that, that actually... That. No, well, hang, just hang on, because that actually does bring us to our next question, which is from uh, Porig Walsh. Recently on the ABC's 7.30, the Prime Minister replied to questions about the Indonesian spying scandal. On two occasions, he asked the questioner, when did this so-called spying allegedly take place? And on a further two occasions, he answered his own question, stating, under the former government. When discussing delicate international affairs on the world stage, I expect our Prime Minister to speak on behalf of Australia. Instead, I watched as he embarrassingly tried to hide behind political party lines and blame others who have governed before him. 
Was this response good enough? Josh Rydenberg. We haven't actually heard the Prime Minister out there blaming uh, the then government. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Prime Minister has adopted a tone of a very serious... Uh, well, he did, uh, to be fair. And the yeah. questioner has this absolutely right. I went back and looked at the transcripts. Uh, is this but, actually this uh, is a public but, transcripts? But Julian asked the question, um, Tony. Julian asked the question, why isn't my mob, uh, the coalition government, out there blaming the Labor Party for oh, the Labor we're, government. We're now responding to the actual question. But, um, but the, yeah. where, where, <laughs> where he's saying that, that the Prime Minister it's actually like did what, that. It's like what I said at the start, which is that was the context for this allegation. That's why it's so difficult for Tony Abbott. He's only been in office for 10 weeks and he's been hit like a bus with this incredible uh, allegation out there. And it's really difficult to manoeuvre through. But if Australia's best interests are going to be preserved, and what are they? That's about enhancing the relationship with Indonesia. It doesn't pay for the government to try to score partisan points out of this by actually attacking the then Labor government, in which, in, which was the time when the allegations are to have occurred. So, but so the I'm going to interrupt you again yeah. because the question is simply asking, um, why, was, why did that happen? Why did the Prime Minister Point use, out that use, it in use the formulation that if this happened, it happened when we weren't here, it happened under the former government? Because that's the fact. Mm. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, he was just putting it in context for, for people out there to understand. But in terms of the tone of his response, in terms of everything that he said in the Parliament, he has not sought nor has his ministers sought to make a partisan point out of this because it's in everybody's interest, and we, we heard about it from Yulia and from me and from Kurt, that uh, Australia and Indonesia have too much at stake to let this relationship deteriorate further. Chris, I, obviously, oh, I obviously wouldn't make a diplomat, but why not just a, a sincere apology right from the start? Because if you were to apologise, uh, Julian, then you would be commenting on the specific intelligence matters. No, and it's it, not you, commenting. Yes, that's it is, because you're actually we're, confirming we're very sorry it happened. No, well, that's right. You're confirming that it actually happened. So, and it's been a long-standing tradition of both sides of politics, and I'm sure Chris would agree, um, Labor and Liberal, that you do not comment on intelligence matters. And to Kurt's earlier point, The Guardian has said that only 1% of the information that they're in possession of is out there in the public arena. And the head of the NSA has something, said something like 200,000 files may have gone missing. This could be a very slow burn. Sure. Today it could be Indonesia. But no, I'm right. just saying, to be making out there apologies, as Julian has said, or as um, senior members of the Labor Party, like Gareth Evans and uh, Bob Carr and others have said, we do not, as a government, think that is the appropriate course. So, I mean, it raises the obvious question. Does that mean you think it's possible down the track you may have to apologise for much, much more? Well, I just don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you know, ask Kurt. He may know more than me. But I, to be honest, Tony, um, I would be astounded if only, with only 1% of that information out there, if there will not be more damaging revelations for Australia and its allies in due course. I don't know, but just by pure mathematics, if 200,000 files have gone missing, and arguably it's in the possession, Kurt, of the Russians now, and the Russian and relation, uh, US relationship is stretched, um, this may be part of a bigger play out there, and I don't, I don't know what the impact of that would be, but Tony Abbott, I think, has adopted exactly the right tone and policy which is not to talk about the specifics of intelligence matters, but to act in a way that we can get the relationship... OK, let's hear Yulia's response to that, because clearly uh, there's not going to be an apology um, for the reasons just well, stated. Well, we don't know what's in the letter, though. True. So do you want an apology, uh, or does the President, I should say, actually want an apology? Because until now he hasn't asked for one. OK, actually, when you're talking about does Indonesia want an apology, you're going to have to dissect which parts of Indonesia you're talking about. If you're talking to people in the intelligence community, like I mentioned earlier, they're saying, you know, let's just drop it. Everybody spies on everybody. We do it too. Although, you know, <laughs> not to anybody. On they have said that. They, in fact, they've gone... That they've was gone, in 1999, during the height of the East Timor crisis, true. where, you know... But, he's, but, they, you but know. they have said, we, we spied on your embassy. We intercepted phones from your embassy. Which years? Of diplomats, Which years? Again, politicians. Again, the issue is this. The issue is this. If you... If, if it accepts... If it is, is accepted that states occasionally spy on one another to gather uh, intel, then fine. That's the intelligence community doing its work. But if you're talking about uh, common Indonesians, they want an explanation first. 
Okay, they want, you know, it might be better if it was worded differently. Don't deny at the outset, just say, okay, I'm new in government, let me look into this. We all realize that the Prime Minister has just gone into uh, office and you know we're not that irrational in, in expecting him to take you know a uh, uh, responsibility for something that happened for his term but nonetheless he is still the head you know the head of government right now so he needs to just chill and say all right let's let's look at this I'll get back to you once we've looked into this and let's talk all right he's got the letter uh, from the Prime Minister mm -hmm. um, would you as a journalist expect that will be made public in Indonesia you know, at this point, I really don't know because, you know, I'd have to say here that just, you know, to give you a little something, Josh, I think both <laughs> leaders have been a little dramatic in handling the situation. It could have gone better also on the side of President uh, Yudo Yono. If he had just, you know, called up Tony Abbott when the thing blew up, it, we might not be here right now. Perhaps he didn't trust his telephone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Twitter. Let's uh, I'll quickly go to uh, Chris Bowen uh, on this issue that the questioner raised, which is how Tony Abbott uh, responded to this initially, and he made the point this happened under the Labor government, if it happened. Well, you're, you're right to point to that as the initial response, and uh, I'd, was, was that appropriate? Uh, probably not. Um, and he's stopped doing it since, I've noticed. Um, from our point of view, we've attempted to give the government the room it needs to get this sorted by not intervening on a daily basis, not providing you know, running commentary on what we might do. The government would be getting very good advice uh, from people like Peter Varghese and Dennis Richardson, who are very, very good experts in this field, the secretaries of the main uh, departments. They would be getting advice about how to deal with this. We've wanted to give them the room and for the Prime Minister to feel he's got the scope to do what is necessary to fix this because it is in the national interest that it be fixed. That's not to say we'll be struck dumb or that we won't uh, comment when we feel it's appropriate, but we've been measured in our response because uh, it is a difficult situation and it does require diplomacy and it does require a level of support for that diplomacy to continue. Uh, very briefly, were you aware it was going on? Uh, well. I'm going to invoke the same principle here because um, <laughs> as I was a member of the National Security Committee of the Cabinet for three years, so uh, I'm under both a moral and a legal obligation not to talk about details of what, I, what I'm aware of and what I'm not. I will say this though, in my experience, the intelligence operations of Australia are very much focused on avoiding terrorist attacks, very much focused on avoiding terrorist attacks and avoiding other illegal activities, as you would expect and hope they are. And they do a good job in avoiding those terrorist attacks, both you know, on Australian soil, and it is a real risk, and uh, where we can assist countries like Indonesia and other countries in working with their agencies to try and stop those attacks occurring. All right, let's go to our next question. It's from Rosalind Catino. Rosalind. Um, the Australian public uh, trust and value the ABC as a source of truth. However, the Indonesian phone tapping story could potentially have negative consequences for innocent parties such as Australian cattle farmers and asylum seekers in Indonesia. So my question is for the whole panel, including Tony, but this could be wishful thinking. <laughs> um, was the choice to run this story a selfish decision by the ABC or should governments be more careful about the potential implications of their intelligence operation in general? Let's and start we'll with the... Tony Jones first. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was an interesting Actually, question. It, uh, let's that's... go to Tara first. Yes, I think that's a very interesting question and, and going from what Josh has said, there's going to be more revelations. Um, and I think anyone who's had any experience with the intelligence um, uh, community will know that there are indeed many, many secrets out there. I think the answer is to get much better about dealing with it. Um, I don't think we can control uh, everyone and say, you're, you're never going to leak any more of this information. It's out there. We know we're in a changing world. Um, we've, got, um, we've got WikiLeaks. We've got, we've got all of this happening. So uh, that's not going to change in the near future. I think that um, the governments need to prepare themselves for that and get really good at dealing with it. And I think as one of the civilians on the panel, I can say that a lot of people feel like it wasn't dealt with um, as well as it could have been by, uh, by our prime minister for whatever reason. So if there are going to be more revelations, I think everybody rather hopes that it will be dealt with more smoothly. All right, I might uh, answer your question by quoting News Limited columnist Piers Ackerman, who wrote uh, last year, I believe freedom is absolute. You either have a free press 
or you do not. The information <laughs> came to the ABC, they published it. I wonder whether News Limited would have published it or held it. That's a very interesting question we probably won't know the answer to. Josh Frydenberg. Well, look, freedom of speech is, is paramount and the freedom of the press, um, and the ABC does have independence under its charter. At the same time, I think there's a responsibility upon all media outlets, including the ABC, particularly as our national broadcaster and as the, uh, the broadcaster responsible about projecting Australia's interests into the region, um, to uphold the public or to print something or to publish something when it's in the public interest. Now, Mark Scott said to Senate Estimates that he thought this information being out there was in the public interest. My personal opinion, Tony, is that it was not. Uh, it has caused uh, immense damage, these allegations, and continues to do so. Uh, in terms of some of our major priorities, which involve people's lives, like border protection and counter-terrorism, this is causing uh, difficulties in terms of our uh, cooperation with Indonesia. So I find it hard to justify the public interest in these allegations being reproduced, uh, as I understand it, came from The Guardian, but in partnership with the ABC, I do find that hard to, to justify in terms of the public interest. Right, before we go to the rest of the panel, we've got a web question to you on this. It's from uh, John Kendall in Bathurst, New South Wales. The Gillard government always maintained their intervention to award the Australia Network uh, the $233 million contract to the ABC was to ensure Australia's national interest was protected. Were the Snowden leaks in our national interest? Well, you've partly answered that, but one of your Senate colleagues has suggested the ABC should be punished in a way and have the Australia Network contract taken away. Well, in terms of the Australian Network, uh, it was really, uh, really stuffed up, really, by the Labor government because they had two tender processes. Uh, there was a scathing Auditor General's report into those processes, even a police investigation. Uh, it was in the end awarded to the ABC after Sky had won those two tenders. Now, in terms of the network going forward, really that's a question for the relevant ministers who are Malcolm Turnbull and Julie Bishop. Uh, do you agree with the sentiment that's being expressed that the ABC should in some way be punished for publishing this information? Um, I wouldn't express that view, but I'm just saying that I find it hard to understand how it was in the public interest for the ABC to publish this material. Um, well, it's probably hard to ask an Indonesian whether it was in <laughs> public interest. <laughs> uh, what do you think, however? Well, What's your perspective? It's very we, different, I imagine. Well, no, we, we discussed this issue. If it were to happen to us, if the, the data came to our network, Compass TV and Compass Gramedia, would we publish it? Uh, the other way around, if it was found out that the Indonesian intelligence community was spying on Australia. But the question is this. Actually, this development we're very interested in how it plays out. Will the ABC be punished? Because as one of the most democratic countries in the world, Indonesia also looks to Australia to see the relationship between the media and government. How much self-censorship is to be allowed in a system where democracy is to be upheld? I mean, we're still growing. The relationship between Indonesia's media and the government is also still evolving. So if this were to happen to the ABC, regardless, because my, you know, our viewpoint is this. It's not the leaking of the information that damaged, that resulted in the damage. It's the spying. So don't, don't mistake, don't, you know, don't. It's like, okay, I, I heard somewhere that uh, spying is like some sort of affair of the heart. You know, it's okay if it's not found out, but when it's found <laughs> out, everybody gets hurt. So, you know, do, do you divulge it? Do you stay quiet? But it's happening. So I, I honestly don't know how to answer that as a member of the media. Julian Burnside. I think the public have a legitimate interest in knowing about these things. And the two most alarming things I can think of in this context is, one, that the ABC would have the information and suppress it, and two, that any government in this country would punish the ABC for having published it. Um, do you find it interesting that the Indonesians are looking for clues? Uh, in how you actually treat the free press in a situation like this. Um, that is interesting, and um, I hope that we can set them a good example. You do not punish the press for responsibly reporting something which, despite Josh saying it's all hypothetical and maybe it happened, maybe it didn't, um, maybe it would have been better if it had been published in the opinion pages as something that might have happened or might not have happened. Uh, it's plainly a story in which we are interested. It's plainly a story which looks as though it betrays some criminality, and I think the public is interested in knowing these things. And it would be profoundly wrong if any government stamped on the ABC for having published it. Chris Byrne. 
I think the ABC is perfectly entitled to make a decision about what's in the public interest uh, here and they've made that decision. Now I have, I don't believe Edward Snowden or Julian Assange are in any way to be lauded or congratulated. Uh, I think what they've done is highly responsible. But the information having been already released, I think, I think media outlets can make that decision. I think it's a fair enough decision for the ABC to, to take. I think the test here is does the release of the information in any way endanger a life? There would be information contained in leaks which would expose agents in other countries to danger and I would hope that all media outlets would in those instances say well clearly the balance is against releasing this information because it would endanger a life and, I, and, I'm, and I'm sure that that would be the approach of the ABC in all instances. Uh, but where they've made the assessment that this will be embarrassing, difficult, messy but not endanger a life, that's a fair enough decision to make and clearly they shouldn't be punished for doing their job. Uh, Kurt Campbell, should democracies put uh, some sort of restriction on freedom of speech or in these circumstances, does the fact you have it written into your constitution um, suggest that national interest is not really uh, the key factor here? I, I very much like the way Chris just laid that out. I think it's exactly right. We find almost on a daily basis something is about to re be reported. There's often a negotiation that takes place between the White House or some part of the U.S. government and the New York Times or some other media outlet. And generally, the, the judgment is if someone is at risk, an agent, or there will be some uh, harm to some uh, group or person who was involved, then that will cause oftentimes the editor to take stock. But if it's only the embarrassment of the government, I'm afraid, uh, uh, tough luck. And, and by the way, I think, Kurt, you may have understated slightly, and Chris understated slightly, the rulings of your Supreme Court in that yeah. area where the touchstone for where uh, freedom of speech uh, will not prevail is whether the revelation uh, involves a clear and present danger to the country. Yeah. Now, that's a pretty high test. Very high uh, standard. Um, and it's, you know, even if there is some risk of someone being hurt somewhere along the line, that would not, that would not uh, cause it to be suppressed under your constitution. OK, let's move along. Our next question comes from Brian Davies. My question's for Julian Burnside. Our government vilifies asylum seekers by falsely accusing them of being illegals. They've set up a wall of secrecy around them. They lock up innocent men, women and children in concentration camps without charge or trial. Now Tony Abbott's condoned human rights abuses in Sri Lanka and he's provided ships so that people, pers people under persecution can't escape. Should we condemn these shameful actions as unworthy of Australia? Now, I know you said it, Sir Julian. I'm going to throw it to Tara <laughs> first because we haven't heard from Tara for a while. Look, that's a question that, that really goes to the heart of something that's been bothering me a great deal. You know, I don't understand how we became so extreme. I really don't. I've, I've been in Australia for nearly two decades now, and, and last week I was very fortunate to be at Parliament House in my role as UNICEF Ambassador for Child Survival, speaking to Senate um, members, uh, members of Parliament from all sides of politics. And these are passionate, real people who care about kids, who care about child rights. And I cannot understand how those people and how Australia in general has become a country so extreme where we lock up kids in detentions, where we separate a mother from her newborn infant when that infant is in neonatal intensive care. I've had a child in neonatal intensive care. I can tell you, to go without seeing her through the night would have killed me, you know? So why do we do this? Why is this a matter of, of national security to protect us from from kids who are escaping terrible trauma. Um, and we can't pretend these traumas aren't happening. We know they are because um, we know what's happening in Syria. We see it on the news every day and we have troops in Afghanistan. We know that these, these terrible things are happening. So I really don't understand how we became such an extreme country in this respect. And when we look um, at the international community, we see that indeed we have become extreme. Um, the UNICEF emergency chief was speaking to us at Parliament House. And he is uh, stationed, he's an Australian, and he's stationed at the moment in Beirut. And Lebanon, as a contrast, has an open border policy. And in a country where they have a total population about that of Sydney, they now have nearly a million refugees there from Syria, about half of whom are children. 
So about one in five people in Lebanon right now is a refugee. And they're trying, they've got those people in the community, they're actually enrolling those kids into their schools as much as they can. And it's, they're overburdened by this. Um, so we look at that and we think, how, how did we get so extreme that we are greeting people who come here seeking help? We're greeting them with our military boats. I, I, I struggle to understand this, and I'm hoping some of, some of the colleagues here well, I mean, I, I, can help. I imagine you're actually talking about both the previous government and the current government. Absolutely. So let's, well, let's Absolutely. hear from uh, Chris and I've Bowen. And I've spoken out about this, as, sure. as Mr. Bowen might well yes. remember, when, uh, when he was immigration minister. And another thing, just quickly, I, I know I'm It'll taking time It'll have to be quick, because we don't have a lot of time. Absolutely. One thing we just need to keep in mind is our immigration minister is the guardian of the unattended minors who come here. And I would put forward the idea that we should have an advocate whose job it is to be the guardians for those kids, because at the moment, their guardian and their jailer are the same person. And I don't believe, I think that's not right. OK, Chris Barn first. Well, look, as we all know, this is a, a terribly difficult issue. And we all want Australia to have as compassionate response as possible, but at the same time, save lives. And we've seen too many deaths at sea. You know, getting the call to say there's been another boat drown, uh, uh, sink and there's children drown, if you stand on Christmas Island and look at the memorial to Civex and see the names and the ages. 351 people died, majority of them children. Sometimes it's just blank with an age because they don't know the name of the child who died anonymously. That is a terrible, terrible problem that we need to fix and it does take some tough decisions. Now, uh, that may, I, I would like to see Australia stick to its 20,000 humanitarian intake. Um, that's something the previous government introduced. This government's taking it away because we can give more people a chance of a life in Australia. But I also do support what Julian would disagree with and Tara might disagree with, which are difficult decisions to try and discourage people to take those journeys to Australia by boat. And on the issue of secrecy, it is completely unacceptable. I mean, being immigration minister is not the easiest job in the world, but you front up and you explain yourself and you, you let people know what's going on. For this government to say, uh, we're not going to tell you what's happening in our detention centres, we're not going to talk about what's happening. We tried to tow a boat back, but it appears towing it back pulled the boat in half and we had to rescue everybody at sea, but we're not going to tell you about it. There is absolutely no excuse for not talking to the Australian people about that. Okay. Absolutely. All right. well, Julian Burnside, and then I'll go to Jeff. Um, first of all, I agree with the thrust of the question, um, um, and I'd like to deal with what Tara raised. I think we've become this extreme because since 2001, coalition governments have constantly called boat people illegal, as you point out. Scott Morrison, in the last 12 months, has repeatedly said that if they're going to be housed in the community, they should be required to report to the police, they shouldn't be placed near vulnerable people, they shouldn't be placed near children. All of these things are calculated to make the public think these are dangerous criminals coming into the community, and they're not. Now, the, of course it's a sensible response to try and protect yourself against dangerous criminals. When you discover that they're just women and children running from persecution, then your response will be very different. Now, um, you know, Chris mentioned the CivX, um, 353 people drowned when the CivX went down. Um, the CivX is a really good illustration why um, the current policy of re re uh, reverting to TPVs is uh, actually basically very cynical. Because the CIVX, most of the people who drowned, most of the women and children who drowned when the CIVX went down in October 2001, were women and children whose husbands and fathers were living in the community in Australia on temporary protection visas. The problem is the visa have a condition, which is you can't get family reunion. And if you want to get back together with your family, they have to use people smugglers. It's the most obvious magnet which will cause people to drown at sea if you impose temporary protection visas with no family reunion. The other thing that I think is worth bearing in mind is that, um, <coughs> you know, of course every drowning is, is tragic. But if what we do is push them back so that they stay back in Afghanistan or Pakistan or wherever they are and get killed there, they're just as dead as if they drown. They drown because they take a risk trying to escape something worse. And I think it's pretty arrogant of us to say that we're actually concerned about them drowning and say, well, you know, just go and die conveniently somewhere else where we don't have to notice <coughs> it. 
OK, I'm going to bring in the rest of the panel. We have another question on this subject. I'll bring that in first. It's from Peter Hindley. Indonesian military officials were recently caught red-handed assisting in the smuggling of 105 individuals into Australia with the simplistic ex excuse that such officials thought that these refugees were simply going on holiday. When will Australia ask Indonesia whether they are either with us or against us? And if they are against us, then perhaps it's time to divert the aid given to Indonesia instead to Australia's needs, such as clean energy production. Josh Frydenberg. Well, I think you can Indonesia. Have on both questions. Yeah, I think Indonesia. There's so many questions here. I think Indonesia is is with us, and obviously we're going through this very difficult patch. But um, as SBY President Yudhoyono said, Indonesia is a victim as well of people smuggling. Um, you know, we have been confronted over the last few years with the greatest peacetime humanitarian tragedy in Australia's history, with more than a thousand people who have lost their lives at sea. The coalition took to the last election a policy which was determined to revert back to what was successful policies under the Howard era. Because when John Howard left office, there were only four people who were in detention, four unauthorised boat arrivals in detention. Today, if you count people who are in community detention with bridging visas, it's about 33,000 people, including so many children. Global so we have to. Global so, refugee movement have increased across so, that So time. we have to take um, strong measures, and what that involves is actually disrupting the business model. Now, Operation Sovereign Borders has only been in something like eight weeks. In that time, the numbers are down by 75 to 80 percent from the last eight weeks of the that's, previous. That's just of not right. previous that's it is just the not right. right, and it was actually that, the information that's just not that was right. revealed. In those weekly briefings, I know you'd like daily There was no information was revealed in the in weekly, weekly briefings, briefings, Josh, and you know it. Um, in those weekly briefings, and... <laughs> look, in that time, with the numbers coming down by 75 to 80%, 80 um, there has been 44 arrests, there have been 33 disruptions, and there's been more than 100 people who have been voluntarily returned to the, to the country in which they came. And one country where we are getting much better cooperation is with Sri Lanka. And to the question, the first questioner's point about the coastal vessels that we're providing to Sri Lanka, Bob Carr came out supporting it, saying he had been thinking about doing it. Um, those boats are to be used with, by the Sri Lankan um, Navy to try, to try to stop the people making their very perilous journey 3,000 kilometres to Australia. So um, this is not an easy issue because uh, consecutive governments have been dealing with it. But if you look at the humanitarian tragedy of all those people who have lost their lives at sea, if you can actually put a sufficient deterrent in place, those numbers will come down. OK, what about about what about just about? the first questioner has his hand up again, so I'll just quickly go back. Well, just going back to the first part of your answer, whilst uh, seeking uh, asylum is a human right, and uh, whilst we should be helping Indonesia as much as possible, if then the Indonesian military are turning around and putting all these individuals' lives at risk by uh, encouraging them to uh, spend $20,000 um, or uh, whatever their currency is, and then making this perilous journey across to Australia, only, uh, knowing that they're most likely going to be uh, turning back, well then, why are we funding this uh, illegal um, uh, operation? OK, I'm just going to quickly go to Yulia on this. Can you understand yeah. the frustration of Australian citizens uh, when they see corrupt Indonesian officials involved in the process of people smuggling. Okay, I understand, like Tony said, how, where you're coming from, and I can't speak on behalf of the government, but anytime something like this happens, you can be sure that the civil society in Indonesia is also, also mm. as frustrated with the situation. It's not the entire, I'm sure, the, you know, the military as an institution, it's it's really hard to, to, I'm not, it's not a justification, but I understand that it's really hard to just, you know, s pr solve this problem. Now, if Australia were to say, okay, either you help us completely or we withdraw aid, it's, it's not an, you know, apple to apple comparison because dealing with the people smuggling issue is also difficult for Indonesia in terms of budget allocation. Mm. So we, uh, in the government, I know, tries to help as much as possible when, when instances like that happen. You know, we, we criticize the government as much as the Australian uh, public does as well. But Indonesia so and Australia have opposite interests in this. It may be a common problem, but we have opposite interests. Indonesia presumably would like to see the asylum seekers move on and get to Australia. We are apparently so frightened of children fleeing persecution that we want to push them back. <laughs> maybe, 
maybe we should think about, seriously think about, establishing a fair income processing centre in Indonesia so they don't risk their lives at sea and offer safe, swift resettlement if they're assessed as refugees. We could do that. We've done it before. Well, sure. It's just that in terms of the size of the population, we're already at, you know, 250-some million people. Yeah. If we were to also accept, which is fine. We'd have to you know, The more the merrier, but at the same time, it's the budget issue. It's it's not a pretty answer, but there it is. It is always a budget issue with okay. Indonesia. Uh, we have a budget issue too. It's called our time. It's nearly <laughs> up. We've got a final question for the year, and it's a video. It's from Terence Hewton in Henley Beach, South Australia. A question for the whole panel. Recently, the editor of the Adelaide Sunday Mail launched a vitriolic attack on Q&A, calling it elitist, boring and costly. Is this sort of rambling and emotive tabloid assault on quality journalism symptomatic of a serious debasement of popular taste, sensibility and intellect, which is characteristic of our times? Or is the point here more that we see in this kind of thing the last gasp of a section of our media as it struggles for survival in the daunting, brave new world of the 21st century? <laughs> now, um, thank you. We're, we're, we're quickly whip around the panel, but what, what better person to tell us about the brave new world of the 21st century? Um, Kurt. Let's get his phone tapped. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about things that happened in the 1960s. Um, Josh. Oh, that was just the latest instalment between News Limited and the ABC, but uh, I think both are going to survive and prosper. Why do you think uh, these instalments must happen? What is it about uh, David Pemberthy and other News Limited people? They can't see what a brilliant show this is. Well, it obviously rates pretty well, <laughs> and, uh, and that's why we're all uh, here to support it. And, uh, and I think uh, you know, Q&A has its place in our media landscape. Yulia, uh, do you take any lessons back to uh, Jakarta with you, having experienced the program? Yes, it's quite scary to be the only <laughs> Indonesian on the panel, but thank you for having me. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Tara. Oh, look, I think Q&A and shows like this are really important and, um, you know, it's a great forum to hear from our politicians to try to find out what re they're really thinking and to be able to ask them questions, you know. This isn't something uh, normal civilians get to do normally, so uh, I think now, it's very important. Well, I, I suppose the question is whether we really do find out what they're thinking or what they think they have to we say. We try. I think you do get a pretty good job. Tony, but um, yeah, it can be difficult to crack. Them. Chris Byrne. Yeah, and I think it's one of the few formats where we can talk about things outside of our portfolio. You can't run away and say, oh, that's not in my portfolio, I can't comment, which is sometimes what we have to do on other shows. You can't do that here. And it is an opportunity to be a, talk a little bit about what you think personally as well as what your party's position is. So I think it's, I don't think you're boring, elite or costly, Tony. <laughs> Julian <Burson. laughs> I agree with Chris. And I would also like to mention the Lowy Institute, uh, who brought Kurt out here <laughs> and who, who um, are one of the great voices of, you know, intelligent debate. There are, there are others, but, you know, the commentator, the questioner, raises a really good point. Maybe the quality of debate in Australia is not what it ought to be, not what it used to be. Um, Q&A, I think, does maintain the quality of debate. The Lowy Institute contributes. Mm -hmm. And there are just a few other organisations in the country that we should value for exactly that reason. Yeah, I'll, I'll quickly go back to, uh, Kurt, final... Uh just get your response on this, because I understand you actually watch this program on C-SPAN yeah. in the United States, which surprised me. Well, look, I'm going to say something that's really hard for Australians to hear, so sort of brace yourself. But generally speaking, Australians are very well regarded. Your public debate is actually quite well established. Your political system operates quite well. And in terms of foreign policy, you punch above your weight more than any country in the world. So it's it's terribly hard to hear. But you're actually quite an effective country. <laughs> OK. <laughs> oh, dear. Thank you very much. It was a bit like the question to Frank Sinatra as he got off the plane. What do you really <laughs> think of us? Um, that's all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Tara Moss, Chris Bowen, Julian Burnside, Yulia Sadamko, and Josh Frydenberg and Kurt Campbell. Thank you very much.
Thank you. That is it for 2013. Our uh, special thanks to the many thousands of people who joined the Q&A audience during the course of the year and asked questions or joined the Twitter conversation. On behalf of Q&A's audiences around the world, as it happens, please give yourselves a quick round of applause. Thank you. Now, over 45 programs, we've done our best to cover the national debate. We'll leave you tonight with the Axis of Awesome, who are going to tell you the story of 2013 in just two and a half minutes. Q and I'll be back in February to start another year of lively debate. Until then, good night. The year of three, the year of three, the year of three prime ministers. And despite their different rhetoric, they all were rather similar. The first was our dear Julia, fiery hair and philosophy. She brought us Gonski, the carbon tax, and battled misogyny. But Kevin stabbed her in the back, and her end was rather grim. Though, to be fair, in 2010, she did the same thing to him. The year of three, the year of three, the year of three prime ministers. And which one did the greatest job? No one in particular. For the briefest moment he was back, that gesticulating Kevin. Perhaps he'd turn it all around and win just like in 07. But it seemed the lodge was not for him, his campaign just wasn't hip. Six years of Labour's faceless men and K-Rod had to zip. The year of three, the year of three, the year of three Prime Ministers. Labour gave us Kevin Jules, harmless but not sinister. So a disillusioned public elected Uncle Tony. The chuggy at stammering daggy dad with skin like abalone. In his first few months as leader, well, he's done quite a bit. Put a whole woman in his cabinet. And lots of other splendid shit. The year of three, the year of three, the year of three prime ministers. And just last week, the ABC took Q&A to India. But it seems that Uncle Tony's a blundering a plenty. And I wish that we could turn back time, cos hindsight's 2020. We could have had a country for every woman, man and farmer. A titanic full of dinosaurs, if only we'd voted for Clive Palmer.